Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Hardware Podcast. My name is Jackson Danner, alongside my good friend Omar Borja. Man, we're coming off with another great week of college football. Man, we're already through September. It's wild. We're heading into the second of three months of college football regular season. And um, yeah, man, I'm excited. A lot of great games this weekend. This is really the time of year where we like find out where you find out like who teams are, right? Like there's, it's going to be tough to like fake it past the October point. So a lot to find out. I know two of my three games of uh, our games to watch this weekend are going to be related. Like, Hey, let's see who these teams really are. Right. So I'm excited, but you tell me, man, what, what are you thinking for this week? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. You know, it's like, I mean, it's great to see uh be back in the action, be able to go to a game. Uh, we were talking beforehand. I was able to see the hometown UTEP Miners upset Boise State for the first time um, ever in six meetings. So those two schools uh, used to play in the WAC. They put in 2,000 humanitarian bowl. Um, but UTEP came and took care of business, much to my surprise. I mean, I didn't think that that Boise State was going to cover the 16-point spread, but I also did not think that UTEP would have beaten uh, would have beaten them outright. But they looked great. Um, and I mean, we talked beforehand too. It's like we, we start to wonder with some of these programs, like well, as coaches start to get fired, like Georgia Tech, are they fixable? Because they just fired Jeff Collins. Did and we talked about uh Boise State, you know, did San Jose State break Boise State in 2020? You know, is that is that something that we should like go back and think about? So uh we'll find out some things. And it's kind of like the time where like, the seat gets pretty uh pretty fiery for a lot of coaches. Um, you know, one such I, I guess I'll talk about it later when one in my games to watch, but yeah. I was actually going to mention something about Jeff Collins during this, right? So he's on, he was on year four of a, of a seven year contract that was worth over 20 million. So a, a pretty, pretty good chunk of change. They had high expectations for him, right? And I hope you would at least for $23 million. Um, he certainly had some low lights, right? Was, they had their first loss to an FCS opponent since the eighties. They had their first shutout at home shutout um uh, not in a good way right they they were shut out at home since the 50s i believe that was in his first year no bowl appearances still haven't won a bowl game since 2016 there were some positive aspects though right maybe not on paper but you could feel like the general like feeling of the program at least in the off season like felt like it was going in the right way right um, didn't really, you didn't really feel that way this time of year, but at least like definitely a, a player's coach, but I'm not too attached to Georgia tech football, but from everything I've seen, it seemed like very much a player's coach, very well liked Omar, you think this was the right move? And if it was, do you think this was really the right time to do it? Kind of, what do you, what do you think on that? They fired their athletic director too, by the way. So this was like, this oh, is wow. your house. I didn't know that. So yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is, this is like a complete, like rebuild it is like not even a third through the season of the of the college football season really a, a good time to do that or well yes because you, you mentioned low lights and I think there are many low lights in the Jeff Collins tenure um and I can think about like think about like three at the top of my head you mentioned loss to the Citadel the year after they switched from the triple option you think about the 24 to 2 loss on the road to two to a temple Jeff Collins' old team where the offense looked absolutely lifeless in at Lincoln Financial Stadium. Um, you also think about 73 to 7, you know, uh, I mean, Clemson versus Georgia Tech. And they were more competitive this year in Georgia Tech. But you just look at the talent, too. Like, you talk about the offseason night, like, Jeff Collins can recruit his tail off for sure. Uh, he absolutely can. But the problem was, like, when you're not winning games with guys like, you know, with guys like Jeff Sims at quarterback or Jameer Gibbs at running back, and you can't keep Jameer Gibbs, you know, it's just like, a compound list of things. And if you ask me, um, I think you should go back to Tulane. I or sorry, go back to Temple. I keep I keep mixing up the the T schools and the and the American, but he should go back to Temple, honestly. And that's kind of the same conversation people are having at right now, I guess, with Brian Harson, who's who's finding himself on the hot seat at the at kind of at the same time that you know Andy Avalos of Boise State is going, is uh, you know, uh finding himself on the hot seat on the hot seat, excuse me, where like, yeah, these coaches, you know, maybe they, maybe their ceilings were at their old schools, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with running a temple program that can, that has potential to run the, to run the table in the American, especially in the new look American, nothing wrong with that for Jeff Collins. But um, I, I just Our, think I'm happy. To, I'm happy to see them like not succeed after trip, after switching from the triple option, nothing against Georgia tech fans, but I'm just a triple option guy. <laughs> 
I think um, my biggest surprise, you, you mentioned that at recruiting, and I, I could have our friend at, at PFF, Connor McQuiston, correct me on this if I'm wrong, because I know he does a lot of analytics on recruiting, but I feel like Georgia is one of those states that, hey, you always know California, you always know Texas, you always know Florida. Georgia has always had that top tier quality, the state of Georgia, but then it re recently there's been a lot more depth to it, right? Like you see Georgia and Ohio specifically be two of those states that are producing not only the top level athletes like Georgia, Texas, and Florida, or excuse me, California, Texas, and Florida, but you're also seeing the depth of the talent in those states. And so it's surprising to me that in such a, a, you know, the most condensed part of Georgia, North Georgia, right around Atlanta, you would think he'd be able to figure that out. You think he'd be able to recruit. I don't know if you remember, uh, this was like a year or two ago, like that whole like feud with, with UGA over like Georgia is doing these like recruiting photo shoots that like talk about Waffle House and being in Atlanta. It's like, Atlanta is not in anywhere like that close to Athens even, right? Like you, they like, Hey, Atlanta is our thing. And like Jeff Collins really went all in on that and doing interviews with like a, a waffle house cup on there. I, I don't know if you saw any of those, but it's like, Hey, you know, we are really the, the true 404 or whatever the, the area code is there. Right. So like, he went all in on the recruiting aspect where that was kind of his personality. It's just like, it's just like he, he hasn't been able to put it together and then look back. I mean, I watched his defense at Florida, right? We know he can do some X's and those stuff. So it's surprising to me. Um, we'll, we'll see where it turns out. Certainly, I think he'll go back I mean, maybe to a lower program than Temple for now, right? And then like work his way up back again to something like that. But we'll see. It's it's the Jeff Collins experiment was certainly interesting. So I'm I'm. Yeah, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. We'll yeah. leave it on a positive note. Yeah, you just reminded me of another of, an, of another low light. The uh, loss of Northern, to Northern Illinois at home game that I was at. Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I guess, yeah, no, like I said, like, I'm not trying to just, uh, it's, memories are coming back, you know, from being in the area and seeing, uh, seeing, you know, I guess Georgia Tech last year. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, more on a more positive note, I guess, uh, Jackson, we can turn the page and talk about our HBCU uh, Pigs Can Showdown Players of the Week and to watch for the following week. And uh, I think, I, I guess I'll start with mine because I think you went first last week. So my one guy uh, in a, I guess, in a HBCU landscape filled with players that just had great performances, uh, one senior that stood out to me uh, was one, uh, sorry, I had to pull it up, put my sticky note. Forgot to have a touch screen. Was Samuel Jordan out of Lincoln University and Philadelphia? And this Lincoln University team was a team that went one and nine last year, and they only scored sixty one points. Now Lincoln has doubled their win total, and they've scored and they scored sixty two points through only four games on the season. So a great improvement. And Samuel Jordan looks to be at the head of it in his last game against Johnson C. Smith. Uh, Lincoln for uh, for Lincoln, Samuel Jordan had 12 carries for 32 yards and two carry uh, two catches for 77 yards, including an electric 72 yard touchdown for over 100 yards all purpose. Uh, he's a senior. You should be able to see him in the uh, HBCU in the HBCU Pigskin Showdown, which you might use as a launching pad to the HBCU Legacy Bowl. Lincoln did not have a participant in either All Star game, so this would be a huge a huge boom for a program that uh, has struggled since they resurrected football after 40 plus years of dormancy. Uh, they, they resurrected football in 2008 and have not had a winning season yet, but maybe Sam and Jordan can uh, get some of that NBC Peacock shine uh, come December at the end of the year and uh, for a resurgent Lincoln program. And I just want to say, just because they haven't had a winning, a winning season since they, you know, kind of re revamped right in 2008, that doesn't mean like there isn't any talent on there. We see like, just watch the NFL draft, man. You see like plenty of players drafted on like bad teams and end up doing great and vice versa. Maybe they're not drafted high, but they end up doing really well in the league. Right. So um absolutely so certainly possible to have a lot of uh or maybe not a lot but some talent on bad teams i'll go ahead and go with my guy jarvion howard uh the running back from alcorn state man he's a syracuse transfer that's just been lighting it up so far this year but particularly caught my attention and omar i want to thank you for mentioning to me as well um in the win versus arkansas pine bluff and 23 attempts just short of 300 yards and four touchdowns 
Omar, what do I say for running backs? If you can't catch, you can't play. It's very established that he can play, but the one reception for two yards just really put the icing on the cake to get over 300 all purpose. So I want to shout out uh, Jarvan Howard. He had a little bit of trouble in the Tulane game, but every other game other than that, at least 20 carries and at least a touchdown. So he's been killing it this year and uh, hope to see him continue light up this season. And then obviously in December, the HBCU pigskin showdown, uh, if he's, if he's lucky enough to get elected, right. Or picked out. So. Yeah. So I got to say this I mean, with Jarvian Howard, I guess first on your point with, uh, with, with uh, Lincoln, I guess, struggling since they resurrected football and uh, at the end of the 2019 season, they did have a hula, a hula bowl invite in Ivan Myrtle as a defensive back who played in the hula bowl, which I mean, was just a great accomplishment for the program, you know, just so at the state it was in, but with Jarvian Howard, this is Syracuse transfer. I, I mean, I, I'm getting chills thinking about the, the backfield with Sean Tucker and uh, Jarvin Howard, if Jarvin Howard had stayed. But, I mean, it's great that Howard is getting playing time out there um, out there at, at Alcorn State. And I got to say now, too, like it just feels like the SWAC East may be a crash course for um, Jackson State and Alcorn State to decide it. Because I believe that game is on the final weekend of the FD, excuse me, of the FBS season. So, you know, that's the week before Thanksgiving weekend. And that's usually not a heavy week for um, – yeah, exactly. It is. It's not a heavy week for great games because the SEC plays their cupcake games. A lot of games are a lot of schools are preparing for rivalry week. So you you might see game day out there in Mississippi for the Soul Bowl. Um, and especially if, uh, if Alcorn State keeps playing like that, you know, I mean, Alcorn State, they they did go to the 2018, 2019 and 2015 um, eight, uh, celebration bowl. So, I mean, Fred McNair uh, is running a great program out there. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, um, some great guys to watch. I love the hula bowl invite. I know you said both all-star games. I just want to make sure for everyone listening, Omar is talking about, I believe both HBCU all-star games, right? Um, is that my, yeah. okay. Uh, got it. Just am, yeah, it Obviously yeah. the hula bowl invite, right? Uh, hula bowl, you know, hula, Reese's shrine bowl, all yeah. those are going to be going to be a little bit different, but yeah um we'll go ahead and go do you want to go with our uh players that we're watching upcoming this week or do you want to kind of recap a little bit of our week four performances um i mean i i mean i, I wouldn't mind uh recapping first and then hitting the players to watch you got it you got it. i'll go ahead and go with the guy i think this is like one of our first division two players that we've talked about on here but a guy who really caught my attention jada byers the running back for virginia union or university yeah, a D2 school and the win versus Virginia Lynchburg 31 attempts 161 yards and three touchdowns on the season so far seven receptions for 68 yards and another two receiving touchdowns he's also been a little bit of kick return duty as well man the the attempts is what really gets me because uh, he has 104 attempts on the year and a seven and a half yards per carry like it's a big sample size and it's also like a very productive yards per carry, like a very productive average, right? Really his main skill that really like pops off is just his contact balance, man. He's 5'7", 180. He is by no means a power back, but the yards after contact is there, even though he doesn't have really the size to like lower his shoulder and run you over. Right. So what does that mean? His contact balance. And you can really see it on there. He's doing awesome stuff. Looking forward to seeing him uh, finish up the year, uh, finish up the season strong. Yeah. So, I mean, for those of you uh, at home that are, are unaware of a D2 football and their awards, the Harlan Hill trophy is the division two football's highest honor. So we're looking at a guy and uh, I guess I'll channel my inner Chris Collinsworth. So here's a guy that can take home not only the Harlan Hill, or not only the uh, Black College Hall, Black College Football Hall of Fame, that's a mouthful, player of the year, but also the Harlan Hill Trophy. Because against uh, against the number two team in Division Two, Valdosta State, uh, in Week Two, Jackson. I know, I know you're from Valdosta. It's in your email. Um, you know, he ran for over 300 yards against that team. That is a phenomenal program out there in Georgia, in Southern Georgia. So I mean, Jada Byers is the real deal. 
I hope he breaks 2,000, to be honest with you. I mean, he I, I'm not sure his, what his on-pace for stats are, but he was averaging over 200 yards until last week. I'm kind of surprised that uh, Virginia Lynchburg, an unaffiliated program, uh, held him to, held, held him to, to below six yards a carry. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to see where Jada Byers and, like, ends up in the awards, you know. I did see the uh, the Valdosta State on his uh, on his game log. Definitely disappointing. Uh, if, if you're unfamiliar, man, go back and um and watch the Football Town series on Valdosta Valdosta football from the NFL Network. Um, just to get you familiar, it's great stuff. But yeah, man, I'll move on to my next guy. Our no, you have. I think we we're just rehashing yeah. about Jaden Byers that whole time. You go with your first guy, rather. Yeah, my, yeah, Jaden Jaden Byers could have been my guy. So my first guy too. Like this was a huge. This was a huge weekend for the borderland. Not only did you have Utah beat Boise State for the first time ever. But for the first time in 11 meetings, New Mexico State beat Hawaii. And our friend Brock's not going to like this. Our good friend Brock of Midnight Sports Today is not going to like this. But I'm picking Star Thompson. And I got to say, in Las Cruces, if you're a fan of the movie A Star is Born, you would have been fan, a fan of Star Thompson's performance. 11 carries for 144 yards and a touchdown against New Mexico State. He could have stayed in longer. But New Mexico State, you know, they're kind of looking like uh, that mid to that mid-2010s kind of rushing attack with uh with uh minnesota that jerry kill had of minnesota with like mitch leitner playing quarterback um and just like the running back by committee well i mean that's just a team i mean i i love the jerry kill hire because you know you play you play i guess conservative football uh run the ball very well i mean i guess that's kind of the uh the strategy you need for programs like new mexico state and i, I wouldn't be surprised if he builds a bowl team but star thompson 11 carries 144 yards and touchdown from mexico state in their first ever win against the hawaii rainbow warriors so uh you know go off it's a, it was a party it was a party in the border in the borderlands this weekend you know absolutely man i'll go ahead and go with with my next guy Cole Snyder, the quarterback from Buffalo, really been steadily improving all year, right? So he did have a rough start on the road against Maryland. Then he gave your team, Omar, and your team, Holy Cross, all that they could really handle. Um, a couple yes, things sir. against Coastal Carolina. Um, but then Saturday, man, against Eastern Michigan, he put up 297 yards, two passing touchdowns. And then on the ground, another two rushing touchdowns, right? So a, a big 50 to 31 win versus Eastern Michigan. Since we're talking about games that already happened, I really want to shout out the uh, the Buffalo defense as well. Um, they not only gave up uh, any points beyond the, the 10 minutes and 38 seconds left in the third quarter mark. So like just five minutes into the second half, right? Gave up no points, only one play in in buffalo territory allowed by the eastern michigan defense and think about it, that was a tight game it was like i believe 30 to 31 something like that and then they really came back and either broke the tie or like ended up winning by three scores but like what a performance by this buffalo defense um so yeah they they killed it and with the the diversity of the receiving core for buffalo too man he's already thrown to like 10 different uh, just in eastern the eastern michigan game alone had like 10 different receivers with the catch like throwing it to everyone you have to cover think about game planning as a defensive coordinator right you look at i know something that you know pretty much every defensive coordinator does right hey let's look at the targets so far this season how many targets is the x getting how many is the z getting how many is their slot man you're gonna have to like start charting for like the third string slot receiver if you're playing buffalo because like, it's just Cole has just been passing the ball around to everyone that gets on the field, which is awesome to see. Um, so yeah, Buffalo as a whole, but particularly, obviously they couldn't have won that game without Cole Snyder and his, uh, his services and passing the ball in, running the ball on the ground. So. Yeah. And that was a really surprising result with like everything that you mentioned with um, Buffalo, not be really being competitive against Maryland, losing to the Holy cross, the fight in Satyrs of the seven Hills, the Holy cross Crusaders. But uh, and then Eastern Michigan went on the road, uh, not just in, not just in the middle of the day, but late at night to beat Arizona State and send Herm Edwards on his way, you know, uh, right or wrong, as uh, some allegations came out this week. But um, but yeah, like really, I mean, and that just shows the balance in the MAC, honestly. Like the MAC, you just cannot tell with the MAC. Like uh, the MAC cannibalizes itself every single year, but that's just a testament to the parity the league has, and just like, I guess the resources are, I guess, evenly spread because the the footprint isn't 
it's not a huge footprint. So you don't have uh, a monopoly of a certain area for each school. Um, you, I mean, all schools are really competing for the same players and, and it shows, you know, recruiting wise. So, I mean, the Mac is always exciting. You, I mean, it's hard to tell. You can't really put like, can't really put a finger on who the favorite is like at the end of September. Is, so, I mean, I can't now, but uh, staying in that great conference for my next guy, I'm going to go to the defensive side of the ball. And uh, Akron, I mean, Akron came into this Liberty game on the road as 28 point underdogs. They only lost 21 to 12 to uh, to that Liberty Flame squad. But leading the defense was Bubba Arslani, who has 16 tackles for Akron on the year. He's got 43 tackles. Uh, I really like what Joe Moorhead's building out there with Akron. I mean, if, uh, if you're a Mississippi State fan, uh, I don't think he was given enough time at Mississippi State. Really redeemed himself at Oregon this past year. Uh, with that, with the offense, we made Anthony Brown. I mean, showed Anthony Brown's true talents, honestly. Uh, something that Steve Adazio failed to do uh, in in that scheme in Boston College. But Bubba Arslanian, the leader of a strong defense, and I think this is the Akron team that could play spoiler in the MAC East. You know, I mean, snag a couple games like this isn't the terrible Akron team of like 2019, 2020. You name it. Like this Akron team is competitive, ready to go, and I think Joe Moorhead also, along with like as well as Jerry Kill could make a bowl team out of this, uh, you know, this upstart program. Yeah, absolutely. And we're about to get into action, I believe, pretty soon, right? Which never hurts for the uh, for the ratings, because I don't I don't know how many how many people are watching uh, just regular, like choosing to watch Mac football over power five, right? Since I believe most of it is on ESPN plus at this point. Um, so yeah, looking forward to, to get into that as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with, with my next, I don't want to say player because it's just a unit as a whole. I got to shout out the Louisiana Monroe backfield on this one. Um, Andrew Henry, Malik Jackson, and then Chandler Rogers. I know not in the backfield technically as a quarterback, but man, did a lot of damage on the ground. Combined 37 carries for exactly 200 yards and three touchdowns. Helped get their first win versus Louisiana, not Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, since 2017 and really since the pre Billy Napier era in, uh, in Louisiana. So awesome to see by that. Um, I, it was kind of running back by committee. They really split the carries pretty evenly. Uh, if, especially if you count Chandler Rogers, I think it was 11, 12 and 13 carries that they each had, but um, awesome stuff that they did and looking forward to seeing, think about it, right. To really like control the clock, you need to run the ball. And man, it's hard to run the ball if you've got like just one running back that's taking like 25, 30 carries. So, hey, let's keep guys fresh. Let's keep them out on the field. Let's play a little, you know, 21 personnel too to kind of mix it up, right? And not have the defense not know who's getting what. So awesome stuff to see by Louisiana Monroe and hope to keep it up because man, if you don't have a star running back like a Derrick Henry or something like that, why not do running back by committee so that you can really keep guys fresh out there and keep controlling the clock. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I mean, so just, this was really like a huge statement game for both, both Louisiana Sunbelt teams uh, for Monroe. You want to see them maintain this consistency because last year they had that huge upset against, uh, against Liberty at home but they couldn't sustain the uh, – they could not sustain, you know, that momentum. Now, this year with this big win against Louisiana, I mean, we'll see if they can sustain it. And if Louisa Monroe had reached six wins, they got to be a shoe in for the New Orleans Bowl. They've never played in the New Orleans Bowl. You want a Louisiana team. Um, the the Superdome is going to look great in that maroon and, uh, and and mustard yellow gold, you know. Uh, and, 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 I mean, like, better I, – I guess, like – I mean, it's similar to Creamsicle. So, I mean, so, so maybe Jackson, you know, maybe you might have some rooting interest there that the, you know, Monroe's uh, yellow is similar to Creamsicle. I'd probably have some more interest if you want to go back to our, our Disney crossover podcast. Oh, gosh. Staying at, <laughs> at Port Orleans French Quarter, grabbing some beignets and having a watch party. Instead of Princess and the Frog, let's watch the New Orleans Bowl. I'm still saying, like, still throwing that idea out there. So. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you heard that. <laughs> I mean, but uh, yeah, on the other hand, for Louisiana, like uh, this was not by design. I did not expect to be talking about Rice, Louisiana, from uh, from a couple of weeks ago, in, in uh, to an extent. But it's like it it just feels like this is a rebuild year for Louisiana, and that's okay. That is okay in this new world of college football, where players have easier access to transfers, easier access to follow their coaches. That is totally fine. Uh, Louisiana is still a. a, a they're in a position to succeed. Like, honestly, I'm not sure how much Billy Napier took with, took to Gainesville with them, Jackson. Of course you would definitely know way more, uh, way more than I would. 
So um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, for Louisiana fans, because at first when Billy Napier was hired by Florida, I'm, if, you don't, if you don't follow me on Twitter, I'm like extremely active on Gator Twitter, just the whole like UF community, right? Um, and we were like kind of joining with the Louisiana football Twitter community of men this Billy guy is awesome. Like you're going to love him. Gator fans. He is the best like enjoy. And then the assistant coach like announcements started coming out. Right. And of course he took Patrick Tony. Okay. Tough loss. We lost our play calling defensive coordinator, but you know, okay, I get it. And then Montreal Johnson, the, uh, the Sunbelt, uh, fre- almost said rookie of the year, freshman of the year transferred. And then Osiris Torrance, the offensive lineman. And then, like, the, like I said, the straw that broke the camel's back was when, like, literally the head videographer for Louisiana football, like, got, got hired by Florida. And what I can only imagine is a pay raise. And it's like, oh, my God gosh, like Billy is taking everyone. So there definitely was, I don't want to say some animosity, but like an understanding a little bit between like Billy and Louisiana. Like he thought that was going to be like a little bit more of like a succession plan for like whenever he did leave Louisiana. Um, But Louisiana, they had the guys stay who stayed and, and they've really done to, they've really tried to make it work with that right and then somewhat successful so far you can still see so many similarities of like things that billy napier brought to because i follow louisiana football on twitter and are on instagram and i'll see stuff i'm like man florida's putting like that exact same thing out there it's just like an orange and blue instead of red and black so you can still see the footprint of billy napier in that program and and it's interesting to watch um but yeah they're making it work we did really take like a ton of guys from Louisiana. I'm not going to lie. Like they, they were left pretty like shallow with that. So, um, some Louisiana, one uh, particular Louisiana football podcast had some, uh, had some choice words about it. I'll, I'll say, it. I'll put it that way, but yeah, I forget what we, how we even got on this topic, but. Yeah. I mean, just said that, that it looks like a rebuild for Louisiana, you know? Yeah. It, oh, it absolutely is. Yeah. a rebuild. Yeah. It absolutely is a rebuild for sure. So, I mean, one team that may not be in a rebuild is the Miami Red Hawks. Red Hawks of Ohio. Of Ohio. Um, I thought so you were going to say the Miami team. Hurricanes for a minute. I was like, man, no, no, no. that Middle Tennessee State loss? Man. Yeah. I'm sorry, I had <laughs> I, to bring it in at some point, you know. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, yeah. So, they, so this Miami team had a good weekend. They beat Northwestern 17-14. Um, and there was a bit of ribbing on Twitter. So there's some trolling on Twitter where they said that they were Chicago's college team, which I thought was hilarious, despite them being in Southern Ohio. But uh, leading the charge them was Keon Mosey, who ran for, who had 21 carries for under 71 yards as the Red Hawks beat Northwestern 17 to 14. Uh, their, I mean, their passing game was, I wouldn't say non-existent, but not efficient, seven for 19, 62 yards. So Mosey really took, uh, he took up the the burden of the of the offense and really, did great against uh, against Northwestern and Northwestern they've lost uh, to Southern Illinois already and now it's lost to Miami I mean I I don't know if I don't know if Pat Fitzgerald's on the hot seat for all he's done for, the, for this program but I mean it, it's just discouraging you know you, you'd think that Northwestern would bounce back after after a year like that but um you know that 2020 uh, pandemic year with the Citrus Bowl win it's looking more and more like a Mickey Mouse year I think the win versus Nebraska really set our standards very high for Louisiana. It wasn't that long ago that they were in the Big Ten Championship, right? And then we see them go to Dublin. They get the win versus Nebraska, especially in the fashion that they wanted. And because it wasn't just the onside kick, like don't get anything wrong. Like Nebraska did a very good job coming back in that game, getting themselves back into that game. It wasn't all Scott Frost, despite what all the meme pages tell you. But and so that set our expectations high. We've seen the disaster in, a, in the context of a power five team like Nebraska that it, that they should be. Um, and obviously there's a reason why they didn't wait, you know, a month to save $6 million to fire Scott Frost. It was that bad. So we had a high expectations coming in after week zero. And then we've seen, uh, maybe Northwestern isn't that good. And it's difficult. And th- this loss really kind of, I think, solidified those um, those fears for some and, and what we suspected for for a couple of weeks now. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, like, like you said, the expectations are high because like we really didn't know anything about anyone. But I mean, it just looks like Nebraska's on its descent. Just looks like a bad Big Ten West team beat another bad Big Ten West team without. I mean, you know, for lack of better. But terms, it was in so. Ireland, so it was fun, and they put it before all the other games. So. Oh yes, yeah, <laughs> sir. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, but really not much to say beyond that. I mean, I guess, I guess Jackson. I don't know if you had one more guy. One more guy. Uh, I do not. I do not. Okay, okay. Go ahead. So, I can move on our players to watch, which I, I, have, I have a bonus. You just mentioned you have one more. I, I have a bonus, and this is a follow up from last Got week it. because on this podcast I told you that that Fordham Ohio would be a shootout, and it was. This may have been a. This was definitely a better quarterback battle than Tua versus Lamar that we got in week two of the NFL season, as Tim Demore at what twenty seven for thirty five. 461 yards and seven touchdowns to the Fordham Rams. And Curtis Rourke topped his performance against Florida Atlantic with 537 yards and 41 to 50 passing and five touchdowns. Like, I mean, I re- I am really beginning to think that uh that that the Patriot League will have two two teams in the playoffs, Holy Cross and Fordham, because it is going to be a crash course um where both teams are going to meet in Worcester and one of those teams is going to win the Patriot League t- and one of those teams is not. You know, another team will probably get it at large. But I mean, Tim Demorat. If you don't, if you don't know this man's name already, through four games, he has eighteen hundred five yards, twenty two touchdowns in four games. Like I think I saw a stat somewhere that said he's on pace for sixty one touchdowns this year. So if he if he ends up dropping fifty touchdowns in FBS season, give this man Heisman votes for give this. He's playing. He's playing in New York City. He's playing in the biggest media market. Give him Heisman votes like right now. You know, I mean, new like Fordham needs to start a campaign to get our man Tim Demorat a Heisman campaign because he is playing in New York City the biggest media market of the world. Like, forget Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge's chase for 61 home runs. Let's get Tim DeMoritz chase for 61 touchdowns. By the way, it was, like, some BS that ESPN kept cutting off, like, the Texas Tech-Texas game and really all their college football games to, like, force us, like, to watch that. It's like the Bird Box or whatever that movie is scene where, like, they're forcing her as I op- her eyes open. It's like, that's what ESPN was trying to do with us to freaking baseball. Um, yeah, I, I want to say, Omar, I think I can speak to this a little bit more since I am in Yonkers, just outside of the city, right? I could turn that, take one wrong turn and like see the skyline. Um, people do not care about college football here, man. It is just like not a thing as much as I wish it was. I miss being in Texas every Friday night and Saturday. I went to, I went to the grocery store here last Friday night. In Texas, it's kind of the combination. You're usually watching, watching college football. You're watching high school football, right? I went there. I was like, don't you people have lives? Like, what? why is it so crowded here? Like, you people should be, like, watching football. Like, normal people. But, yeah, no, not a thing up here, unfortunately. Um, anyways, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go with um, – I can kind of kick off our players to watch. Uh, I'm going to go with Xavier Smith, the wide receiver from Florida A&M. Like I said, tough year to start for some of these guys on the road in North Carolina where they competed for the beginning. I remember like really saying, hey, watch out, like Florida A&M is going to compete. Ultimately kind of fell apart in the second half. And then again, that game for sure. Um, but since then, 16 receptions for 214 yards and four touchdowns, so not bad. They've got a game versus Mississippi Valley State this week at 6 p.m. I know MVSU hasn't had the season that they were hoping, uh, but neither has Florida a and honestly, at 2-2, two and two, right? So I'd like to see some consistency, stay on pace at eight more catches, 100 yards, maybe a couple touchdowns in there. So either pad the stats or just show us that, hey, these past two weeks weren't a fluke. Yeah, so you mentioned Mississippi Valley State. I mean, that should be a, a very competitive game. I guess a competitive game because, I mean, you look at the score of Jackson State, Mississippi, Mississippi Valley State, 49-7, the, the Jackson State Tigers won. But, I mean, Mississippi Valley State ran wild on um, on Jackson State's defense. I mean, they had they had trouble um, – yeah, they had trouble defending the run against Mississippi Valley State. They allowed 181 yards on the ground. Uh, and then, I mean, the passing game needs work if they're going to keep up. But but then again, I mean, why the score is so high, and I've seen complaints about this, is is uh, Coach Coach Prime left his son in Shador too long, which, frankly, I think he did. There's no reason. There's honestly no reason for Shador Sanders to throw 51 passes and 49-7 blowout. 
Like there, there is no reason for that. Like that, that is There's just ridiculous. There's also no reason to have Justin Herbert out there without his left tackle. Like with like, they were trying to like go down the field with like 20 seconds left down 28. It's like, man, just like call it a day. Don't risk your quarterback who's coming off of a rib injury anymore. Like, I, I don't know what's going on in the past couple of weeks. We've seen a couple of questionable decisions as far as quarterback play went into blowout, but yeah, man, that it needs to stop. Yeah. 51 passes really like, like, like really, there is no reason for, for him to be, to be throwing 12 less passes than Josh Allen did this Sunday. Like no reason for that. But um, yeah, I guess for my first guy, I'm going to stay in the, F, in the FCS level. And uh, Fred Payton, if the, this is the guy, if you're a Coastal Carolina fan, Georgia Southern fan, you remember Fred Payton started a game during the 2020 season for Grace McCall. Fred Payton's having a solid year himself out there at Mercer in Macon, Georgia. Uh, 891 yards, 11 touchdowns, zero interceptions for 3-1 and one Mercer, uh, who had their only loss to Auburn, 42-16. So they played, they played well as well as they could against Auburn. Um, but Mercer's never been in the FCS playoffs. The SoCon looks open this year, and they play 0-4 Wofford this week. A 4-1 start for the Mercer Bears would be huge for that program. And Fred Payton, you might have a dark horse uh, Walter Payton award. How, how cool would it be to have Fred Payton win the Walter Payton? It would, man. That would be awesome to see. Um, that would be That'd be awesome. <laughs> no, that'd be, just be meant to be, right? Uh, the uh, the script writers would have a busy day. With that oh one. gosh! <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go with uh, with my next guy, Rishi Rice, the wide receiver from Southern Methodist or uh, SMU. Uh, the re- honestly, the receiving leader in college football right now, right? With 565 yards over four games, and he's only doing it with 34 catches. So, like an amazing average. 6'2", 203 pounds, really has that explosiveness where he can overtake guys in coverage. And just, uh, it's not always just mossing guys. I don't want to say that because it's not like overwhelming physicality. It's just like using, and it's not like over the top speed, like Scotty Miller or anything like that. It's just like short area quickness where he's like really can manipulate guys. And it's really, it's really impressive to watch. And this is a program that we've seen. They developed Emmanuel Sanders. They developed Danny Gray, a guy we talked about on the, the 49ers uh, podcast we guested on. And then Reggie Robinson as well. This is a program that's developed. I mean, no one's saying SMU is like wide receiver U, right? But it's like this is a, a group of folks school that's produced some talent over the years. So, yeah, I mean, Niner Nuts. Sorry. Niner Nuts. Yeah. Oh, I, I was blanking on the name, but Niner Nuts. Also a great podcast if you're looking for anything 49ers content. Yeah, I mean, we're, I'm waiting for Danny Gray to get more targets, you know, for the Niners. But, I mean, yeah, you mentioned that, like, um, Sonny, or Sonny Dykes did a great job with that program. It's now Rhett Lashley's program. But, I mean, a couple of names you missed. I mean, like, um, James Prochet, you know, uh, drafted by the Ravens. Um, Trey Quinn, you know, drafted by the Washington Commanders. Uh, so, yeah, like, it's it's great to see the lineage for SMU continuing uh, continuing on. And, I mean, yeah, they got they got a huge game against, uh, against UCF, you said. Is it? Is it UCF they play against this week? Um, it is. Oh man, I forgot to write it down. My bad. Um, no, you're fine. Um, it's gonna be obviously play TCU last week. Um, this is gonna be uh UCF uh yeah, on the okay. road on Sunday actually. At oh Wednesday. right, he's a hurricane. So, yeah. So yeah, some of these oh, some of these yeah. games, Florida, Eastern Washington, SMU, UCF, really all those are are kind of getting pushed back towards Sunday. So. Yeah, I mean, for sure. So, yeah, should I, I mean, should be a great game with a lot of fireworks for both offenses. Uh, should, next for my next shall guy. we see, like, another, like, Jim McElwain, FSU, or LSU in, in Florida kind of feud start because of a hurricane between oh, SMU and, and UCF? Dang. Uh, I yeah. Interest in that? I should have known. If anything, it would probably be uh, more between uh, Eastern Washington and, and Florida, where a Florida, Florida squeaks by Eastern Washington and uh, – <laughs> And Billy Napier ends up crying on the field about about people about people from uh Eastern Washington, you know, trash talking during hurricane. You played yourself, Jackson. Yeah, you played yourself. Uh, I walked into that one. That's my own fault. But uh, on that on that note, um, you know, staying in the Pacific Northwest, 
and put Pacific. Uh, you have Jaden Ott for me, my next guy for the Cal Bears. Had 19 carries for 274 yards and three touchdowns versus Arizona last week. This year in the season, he has 463 yards on only 56 carries for three and one Cal. And Cal is an interesting program because you know they're going to play good defense with uh, Justin Wilcox out there in California. You know they're going to play good defense. It's always been the offense has been a hurdle for this program. And Jaden Ott seems to be the perfect guy. Like with it, with that in mind, like you want to see him get more carries and be a workhorse for that program because I mean they they kind of need it with uh with the offense struggles and the defense they have. Cal is three and one. I don't know how many people I don't know how many people gave up on Cal after they lost in Notre Dame, but Cal is three and one. They are very much alive in the Pac-12 North. And they played Washington State. You know, honestly, if Clemson had lost last week, I mean, I guess game day would have been at Wake Forest, Florida State. But California versus Washington State would have been a dark horse candidate for game day if, if Wazoo won. But that is definitely a game to watch out on the West Coast. And honestly, um, if Washington State loses, they're probably eliminated from the Pac-12 title race with two conference losses. Cal might still be alive because they still have Oregon State and Oregon still in the north. But um, just a huge game out West. And I, I don't think it's going to get the attention deserves, honestly. We're going to have to talk about that. There's going to be a lot to talk about concerning the PAC 12 race to the, their title game, right? So that's definitely something we're going to have to talk about on, on bulls and boosts this upcoming Monday night. Um, I'll go ahead and go with, with my last guy. Uh, speaking of the PAC 12, Michael Penix, the quarterback from Washington, man, a guy that we've talked Big about. Big Penix bit. energy. <laughs> Thank you, RG3. Um, oh my gosh. Wow. Lots of lots of RG3 commentary from this year. But I will move on. Uh, the junior from Tampa, Florida, man, putting almost 1,400 yards in the air, 12 touchdowns, one interception. Nothing really to speak of in the running game for him, but zero sacks on the year, which is something that you usually see. Like if if the rush yards aren't there, the sacks are, but we're not seeing either, which I mean, I'll take it, right? A uh, big Friday night game versus UCLA at 1030 Eastern. What I really find remarkable is that Mike has, has done this when he wasn't even announced to be the starter for Washington until like late August. Remember that whole like three-way competition between Sam Huard and Dylan Morris. It's been amazing what he's done so far, considering he just took control of this team, despite all the hype that I know we've talked about him before a lot of hype that he's gotten from previous years. So Awesome to see him and hope to see the, the continued success against UCLA. Yeah, I mean, again, this game was not on a Friday night. Game day would be there, you know. I mean, but um, I, I think with this game, you can see as, as we um, later on in the season, we'll shift to our Heisman talk and whatnot. If uh, you can see kind of DTR switch out for Mike Penix in uh, the Heisman race. So DTR is a huge game. Now, DTR is taking a while and UCLA. They've squeaked by a couple of teams, you know, Bowling Green and uh, South Alabama. But I mean, like you, they, they're still, they're, that's a 4-0 team. They're still 4-0. So um, they're still very much allowed in the Pac-12 South. So a huge game. Um, you kind of, you kind of hate to see the Pac-12 doing this to their teams with these Friday night games, you know, because the list goes on and on and on. Like 2017, you had USC lose on a Friday night when, and, you know, they ended up with two losses out of the playoff. In 2018, you had uh, Washington State lose a game to USC and they ended up with two losses out of the playoff. Utah in 2019, you know, Friday night game, end up with two losses out of the playoff. You know, so you see a recurring trend here. And, and, I mean, I hope that trend doesn't continue. But, you know, I just think the league needs better management, you know, for that for that point. But, uh, yeah, so it should be a great game. A lot of fireworks on a Friday night. You know, what's not to love? Uh, for my last guy, I got um, App State, you know. That, it was a tough week for Mountaineer fans. You know, no, uh, no really, I guess, cutting corners on that. But uh, the defense has been sort of a weak point for the for the team, you know. But uh, there is, I mean, there's a bright spot in Nick Hampton, five sacks, 5.5 TFLs for the Mountaineers. And this this should be a great matchup for him, you know, on defense because they play the Citadel triple option team that has struggled this season. Uh, they only had they only ran for 82 yards on 48 carries against uh, Mercer. So Nick Hampton should be should be feasting out, you know, on uh, on those wing back to on those slot back toss sweeps, you know, on those pitches out in the edge on the triple option. So Nick Hampton should have a big game for a motivated App State team. Um, yeah. This is an app state team that usually when we see like college game day go to anything other than a power five school is usually because they're having like unusually sustained success. And it's usually deeper in the season, right? It's usually we're at least pushing October, usually November when we see that. 
Um, and it was interesting that they went to a group of five school halfway through September, hardly that already had a loss. And I understand they beat Texas A&M. It's still interesting to me though, that I think this, like we we've given app state so much credit for the A&M win that, okay, maybe that was more of an AM loss and it was an app state win, you know, and now we're kind of seeing that now they're, they're, you know, 500. Right. So um, I'll move on. I hate to end on a negative note. I just think it's worth mentioning, especially for us college game day fans that, uh, that, get a lot of college football record, reporting from these guys. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and go uh, with my uh, – did you have any more players to watch this week, or do you want to go ahead and move on to games to watch? Games to watch. I, I, I got no, I got none. You got it. You got it. I'm going to go ahead and go with Stephen F. Austin at Sam Houston State. It's going to be 3.30 Eastern on ESPN+. Plus. No need to watch Arkansas and Alabama, man. This is going to have all the offense that you could wish for. Um. Third and fourth place in the WAC, respectively, right? So kind of fighting for the chance to stay alive in there. Sam Houston State, one of the more successful programs outside of North Dakota State in the FCS. Stephen F. Austin, man, I don't, I'm sure you saw it. 98 to nothing victory this past week. I don't care who you're playing. I had never heard of the school. That is impressive because we saw Georgia struggle versus Kent State. We've seen plenty of teams that, like, are dominant like should win by like large margins and like we've never seen anything like that that i can remember at least right 98 to nothing is just insane so um excited to see how they kind of respond to that i can only imagine how exhausted the offense is still running out there but um definitely an exciting one to to watch and at least keep an eye on like how does this sam uh, how does out of sam houston state respond to being uh having a losing record after you know winning so much just a couple of years ago and then Stephen f austin after an incredible week yeah so um the reason i was so excited for you to say this because this is a the last edition for the immediate future of, of a great rivalry the two schools the battle of the piney woods uh, Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston State, they've met 95 times before. This will be the last meeting in the immediate future uh, as Sam Houston State goes to Conference USA. So um, boo Conference USA and Conference realignment. This sucks. But again, all the more reason to watch some action, honestly. I mean, you know, it's it's going to be uh, there. I, if I could bet money on there being a pregame brawl, I, I definitely would bet on it. There, there. I think there will be a pregame brawl. I mean, because these schools are so close to each other. So uh, very excited for that one. Uh, so for my first game of the week, I'm going to start off with the premiere of the greatest tradition in, co- in, you know, college football television. You got Ivy League Friday nights. The first game starts off with a bang. You have Dartmouth versus Penn. Penn is 2-0 and after struggling last year in the Ivy League. Uh, they are fresh off a shutout against uh, Lafayette, where they only allowed one rushing yard, of course, with sacks, but one rushing yard. And, I mean, a 12 nothing victory, hard-fought 12 nothing victory. Dartmouth, on the other hand, is coming off of a lo- an upset loss to Sacred Heart, a Sacred Heart team that lost to Lafayette and that has also lost to a Morgan State, our friend Neil Boudreaux's alma mater, and has not looked, good, not looked like the NEC champs, the Northeast Conference champs that they were. Um, Dartmouth lost, but I mean, geez, their quarterback, Nick Howard, that man, that man can run the ball so well. He's the Colin Klein of the woods of New Hampshire. He had 24 carries for 186 yards. You want to see him grow as a passer because he only, he attempted less than I think 20 passes last year being the running quarterback Dartmouth scheme. So he's still improving as a passer. We'll see how much he's improved or if he'll, or if he will even need to throw against Penn, you know, cause having your quarterback run for 186 yards should do the job, you know? But Friday night, ESPNU, Franklin, or no, <laughs> sorry, Hanover, New Hampshire, Memorial Stadium, be there, be square. And what a what a loaded Friday night of college football we have, too. We have Tulane, Houston, two teams that we've talked about a pretty decent amount, San Diego State, Boise State, two Mountain West teams that are right at two and two. It'll be interesting to see how Boise State responds. Washington, UCLA, which we've already talked about, and then New Mexico, UNLV, and then, of course, uh, uh, Ivy League Friday nights as well, because you need to spend all of Saturday studying. So that'll be uh, awesome to awesome to see. I'll go ahead and go with my next game. My last two games are actually, I, I don't like doing this typically, but you'll see why they're both power five games. I think they deserve to be talked about. So the first one I'm going to go with Texas Tech, my, alum, my, uh, my school, 
at Kansas State, right? Noon Eastern on ESPN+. Plus. These are two teams that are coming off of games that no one expected them to win, right? Kansas State beating Oklahoma and Texas Tech being Texas in overtime. Uh, this Kansas State offense is definitely something I'm worried about. Adrian Martinez, the quarterback, obviously just re- – Omar didn't pass, ran – for 148 yards and four touchdowns. When you have that also with Deuce Vaughn, a guy we've talked about, that is a really hard run game to to cover between those two. Uh, In my opinion, looking at it from Texas Tech's perspective, right? So obviously control the line of scrimmage. Everyone knows that. Um, I'd like to see I remember during COVID, I, I did, I, I watched a lot of film on Patrick Mahomes. And the one thing when he would take off and scramble that you couldn't do, the common denominator was you either blitz or you get pressure up the middle, like the A gap or B gap. So that's something I want to see. Don't try and get much penetration up the middle, right? Try and get those edge rushers around the sides, contain, contain Adrian Martinez and don't allow them to take off because once that defensive tackle or that nose tackle gets up the middle and gets it where you put pressure on Mahomes, you would see him just scramble around the edge rusher, whether it's behind him or in front of him, and get a 20-yard gain. Um, and that's something that you have to treat a, a running quarterback in, the, in Adrian Martinez's style. I think you have to do the same thing. So... Um, I'm excited to see that. Another player that uh, Joey McGuire, the Texas Tech head coach, mentioned Eli Higgins, who I was not familiar with, the defensive lineman from Kansas State, really jumping off the screen, not stat-wise, but um, really if you put on the the All-22 looking good, or at least so I've heard from people who know a lot more than me. So I'll take that. Yeah, I mean, Texas Tech does look like a contender in the Big 12. I mean, Big 12 looks open again now uh, with Kansas State beating Oklahoma. Keep in mind that the top two teams will play in the conference championship game. No uh, divisions. So, no divisions. No divisions. Yeah. So, I mean, that could be a combination of so many teams that look like they are, you know, in the thick of it. So, uh, very excited for that one, too. I mean, you, you just wouldn't think, like, you think about the old Big 12 of, like, our childhood. That's, like, a Big 12, Big 12 South, is Big 12 North team. You know, you wouldn't think about, like, that. Like, it, it's – even then, it, I think even now it still takes some getting used to. But I, I'm excited. It's funny that Adrian Martinez is the one taking the headlines and not do – but, uh, but yeah, no, you, you love to see it. But uh, for my next game is a game that uh, I've encouraged you to go to, one, uh, one William Jackson Danner, Howard versus Yale at the Yale Bowl. This is Yale's first uh, HBCU opponent since 1984, since the Reagan administration first term. And this will, I mean, Howard plays two Ivy League teams this year. So, I mean, you'll kind of see, I guess, Howard sort of get used to the slower pace, I guess, play of the Ivy League in this first game at New Haven at the Yale Bowl. Uh, this game will be, as I look at the time, um, Yale lost week one, or yeah, Yale lost week one to Holy Cross for their worst loss in 34 meetings against Crusaders, 38 to 14. Uh, they flipped the fate, they, they literally flipped the script, won 38 14 against Cornell the, uh, this past week. Uh, the offense looked good. Nolan Grooms had went 12 17 and Fish 12 17. Um, and the receiving core looked good, especially one, um, Mason Tipton, who had 133 yards and six catches. But again, Yale's only played two games. Howard's played four game, four games. So you wonder if like the in-game experience will matter, even though Howard is one in three. Uh Howard played South Florida pretty competitively out at um out of Raymond James. So there's that. But this game should be pretty good. I mean, you know, I guess the New York City Metro is getting pretty familiar with uh with Howard with the, their game at MetLife and now at Yale. But, you know, I think this game will be closer than the people, than the experts think. And, you know, I mean, Yale, Yale, Yale doesn't look as good as they have been in recent years. So, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that'll be definitely one to watch. Still trying to figure out the logistics on that, man. Hey, we'll see. We'll see. Definitely a possibility. If not, I promise you will at least be on one of the teams. Jackson, just go, man. Just Florida's playing on Sunday, man. Just just go. Yeah, I know, man. I'm gonna have to choose between my two loves, Florida football and the red zone channel. So that's gonna be that's gonna be tough enough. Um, but Saturday's open. Just just go to go to Yale Howard. <laughs> <laughs> um quick uh quick side note that I want to go ahead. I want to throw it back to last week when we do, were doing our players to watch. One of mine was Asher O'Hara, the middle Tennessee transfer who went to Sacramento State obviously played versus Colorado state on the mountain West network. 
And what did I say, Omar? I don't know if you remember. It was a small sample size of what we had, but what we had was awesome. I just want to say the exact same thing applies to the Colorado State game. Small sample size, only 10 passes. The damage he did in those, though, 10 for 10, 71 yards, one touchdown, and another two rushing touchdowns on the ground. So I just want to kind of shout myself out there, I guess. I don't know. Ashro O'Hara, man. He's not gonna. Th- it's not gonna be the air raid, but like what he actually throws is gonna be on on right on the spot. So, yeah. And um, I think Omar, being a West Point graduate, you're familiar with the offenses that don't pass the ball much, but then don't have much success passing the ball either. So, you know, I am. Um, and that actual. Well, no, I don't think it's my next, though, with my, with my last game of the week. I mean, the Commander in Chiefs trophy, the first leg starts this Saturday. You have Air Force versus Navy. Navy travels to Colorado Springs. And um, honestly, I think uh, Kenny Amatolo's seat's going to get even hotter if he does not beat Air Force in this game. And if it's or and if it's if it's a blowout like last year, the offense looked like last year's game against uh, against Air Force the offense looked absolutely horrible. Uh, they had 36 yards rushing on 34 carries, one yard per carry. Uh, and the even worse, the game was on CBS. This game's on CBS. Uh, shoot, uh, I, I think I think Rich Waltz is calling this game next week. I know he's calling the Army Air Force game. It makes sense if he calls this one too. But I guess an awards dark horse I want to bring my bring light to is Brad Roberts from the, from the Air Force Academy. And this is the guy that has 465 yards in four games at the fullback position on 68 carries with seven touchdowns. So, I mean, if Air Force makes some noise, the Air Force is a dark horse of the New Year's Six, I believe. You see Air Force break into the Cotton Bowl, I think uh, Brad Roberts should get some Heisman love. You know, it, it, it's there. It's, you know, Fred, I know Top Gun is a, is a film about naval aviators, but he plays for Air Force. The common American isn't going to isn't gonna connect those dots together. and be like, oh, pilot, Air Force guy? Bam, this guy should be a Heisman finalist. Exactly, exactly. All you got to do is get the sunglasses and it's good to go. <laughs> but yeah, on that I note mean, too, so, sorry, my bad, Jackson. I, 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 I wanted to add too that both of these teams, like this game should like, t- I, I think you should take the under on this game because both these teams love to run the ball inside. I uh, watched Navy's game last week against East Carolina extensively. They're, be- they're beginning to run more wingback dives because they're having trouble getting the ball out on the edge. Um, both their fullbacks are are very capable but yeah so sorry, sorry to cut you off jackson just forgot to add that no no absolutely it's in where's the game at again oh it's at colorado springs it's um, at, okay so yeah yeah i thought you said that i just i just wanted to make 10 sure. a.m start um, time local time yeah it'll be a 10 a.m local start just oh, for the wow. tv that's yeah early. so it oh is. my gosh that's really yeah. what what's the phrase like 62 28 breathe it in i'll suffocate by uh by air force right so high elevation oh, it's gonna be i don't know Oh, I, I thought that was a, that was a thing there at, at USAPA. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with, uh, with my last game. Like I mentioned earlier, power five game, Oregon state and Utah, man. Mm, like talk about a game where you're going to find out like who you are, especially where you stand in your conference, Oregon state coming off of a, a really heartbreaking loss versus USC at home. Right. Like very, very difficult. I would, I'm not going to say difficult to watch because no one could watch it because it was on the Pac-12 network. Um, but uh, no one expected much of Oregon State. And now they're really, if they lose this game, they're staring for 500 in the face because you have a road game at Oregon after this. And Oregon, I'm not saying Stanford is like the toughest place to play, but it's it's Oregon State. Like it's very feasible to think that they could win that game, right? Um, And then you have Utah. Utah lost to what we now know is a bad Florida team. And their main hope really is to have no conference losses going into the USC game October 15th. So mm, it's going to be tough. Utah, USC could potentially be a huge game. But if they kind of, I mean, Utah's been on a roller coaster this year, right? They had like that tough loss to Florida and then they scored like 70 million points the next week. So I guess I believe it was like Southern Utah, right? So it's like, they've been on a roller coaster. Oregon State is coming off of a brutal loss. I'm interested to see how both these teams really respond and kind of how they, what, where are the expectations for both these teams going into the, the, the Pac-12 championship later? Is like, is that the goal for these teams? As it just understood, it's going to be USC and fill in the blank from there. I'm interested, like I said, to see how these teams will react to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, and again, 
for Oregon State, I mean, this – I won't say playoff eliminator. For Oregon State, it may be a um, Pac-12 title game eliminator. Like, they may not be the – Oh, part. absolutely. They probably, they it would won't be, be the two conference there. losses yeah. as Oregon State would you, – I mean, you're you're done, honestly. Not, not playoff, yeah. But um, I guess, yeah, for the conference, yeah. In conference, definitely could be – or would be an eliminator. Utah, for sure. I mean, one loss, they could recover from one loss and then beat USC and have the tiebreaker there over – Trojan so yeah absolutely I mean I, I shared the frustration of trying to watch USC Oregon State too and only and only being able to, to watch Stanford Washington you know um last week on FS1 obviously not the better game I think it was Greg McElroy or one of the ESPN analysts that posted like I'm trying to watch USC Oregon State like if he can't watch it you know no one can watch it so yeah so yeah just a, just a shame there but uh yeah I mean the Pac-12 again very competitive all around Again, once I again, was, I think it was Matt Berry that offered to FaceTime him. Like, hey, you want to like want me a FaceTime hey. you so you can watch the game? Like, <laughs> Matt Berry promoting yeah, a, with the Pac-12 Network. Yeah, Matt Berry promoting a competitor. I I, I don't think the suits at ESPN would uh, respond so well to that to promoting a, <laughs> a competitor. But uh, I, I guess with that note, uh, another week of hardware is complete. Um, I don't have anything to add. I'm just excited. I do not. I do not. I'm excited for another great week of college football. It's going to be like nice to have like kind of a stress-free Saturday, right? I can just kind of sit back and relax now that I don't have Florida to worry about. Um, So it'll be, it'll be good. Yeah. I mean, and we'll see maybe going on the road, not taking the subway, figuring, figuring, figuring out. Oh, it won't be the subway. It'll be the Metro North. It's a much more calm ride in the Metro North, not the subway. (laughs) Same. You know, subways underground, Metro North. You know, you know, we, we both know the drill. No one cares. It's all the same. It all sucks. There's rats on all of them. Dang. Wow. Uh, may, I mean, Metro North it goes, it goes to Connecticut. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. I digress. But uh, but yeah, you know, um, great weekend. Uh, so hopefully, we both will be um at games on site for hardware. For uh, we call them site visits, but it's just us going to games. It's nothing special. But it's not like game day. It's just us going to games. You know, we're just trying. We're just trying to be. It's just us. They don't have any desk. There's no security or anything. Believe me. No desk. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But but, you know, it it's cool to dream. I guess. (laughs) But um, yeah. I guess until next time. Until next week, everyone. Uh, this this has been fun. Great as always. Uh, until next time, everyone. Peace, love, and soul.